Hey everyone, it's the host of All Across America, Marco Vig, jumping in for a few seconds before the show to thank you all for listening, to let you know that I want to hear from you. Tell me what you like about the show, and send me your suggestions too. Follow us on Instagram, at AllXAmerica, or visit the website, allacrossamerica.net, and you can use our contact page there. If you want to support us, we're on Patreon, at patreon.com slash allacrossamerica. Try to respond personally to everyone who reaches out, so say hello. All right, on with the show. Podcasting from Portland East to Portland West, Big Pine Key to Pacific Beach, and from San Juan to Guam. This is All Across America. Well, hey, let's let's jump into it, Matthew, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, if you could tell folks about the official Preppy Handbook for people that may not know it. Sure. So the official Preppy Handbook um, is a book that was written in 1980. The principal author was Lisa Bernback, but there were a few other people that co-authored it with her. Um, they were all young people in their 20s who were writing about uh, a trend which was really, it's really more than a trend. It's a classic lifestyle and look called preppy, which which is really the style that is um, synonymous with uh, sort of the old upper class in America, the upper class waspy elite and the, the clothes they wear and the style of dress and, and the lifestyle basically. And by 1980, it seemed like it was time to write a book to summarize that lifestyle. They also... Um, the authors also made it deliberately a humor book. It's very much a, a book to sort of poke gentle fun at that group of people. But at the same time, it became a bestseller that also became somewhat of a manual for those who were aspirational and wanted to adopt that style and aspired to live that lifestyle, which, of course, in the 80s was extremely, po- extremely popular, um, sort of fit in with with the yuppie yuppie movement of the time which was a parallel the, movement the zeitgeist of the spirit of the times and you know the exactly. reagan era exactly and 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 of course the what yuppies i think wanted in the 80s was to not look like their money was new and so if they could look like their money was older and of course the the things that followed that that would owe a great debt to it um, ralph lauren uh, for one who was started as a tie salesman and and later became a lifestyle marketer selling the American dream in various forms. A lot of his looks are very preppy, of course. Ralph um, Lipschitz. Was Ralph it? Lipschitz. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, J. Crew, the brand J. Crew really owes a lot of its existence. Um, they just had a they just celebrated their anniversary as a brand and 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 they mentioned the preppy handbook as one of the forerunners to to their whole concept so it it really had far-reaching impact well beyond probably anything that the original authors anticipated and so here we are um, 43 years later they stopped printing it for whatever reason in 1986 they had i don't know i read 38 printings a couple million i have no idea why they stopped printing it but it's now more popular than ever you look on amazon yeah. it's 150 dollars for you know the only copies that are available right so exactly why, why did they stop printing it why do you think it's so popular again i um i'm not entirely sure why they stopped printing it although i did see lisa burnback mention in an interview not too long ago recent interview in fact that um that that they that they couldn't reprint it now. Um, that was a question that someone asked uh, in I think the Chicago news. Why can't they reprint the book now? And it was it was really about rights. Um, and so many people were involved in the book, and some of those people are have passed away, for example. So they can't reprint it. But why did they stop so soon in '86? I don't know. Um, I know that I was a f- freshman in high school in '86. And I got, I think, my one of the last copies in print because I did get it at a bookstore. I, I made a special order and I picked it up at a local bookstore in Norwalk, Connecticut. And then for the next few years, I really studied it just like everybody else. So now it was the late 80s. Um, I referred to it when I was looking for colleges. And so by the late, late 80s, when I was applying to colleges, I ended up applying early decision to one of the colleges listed in the in the top 20 list of colleges was just trinity college in hartford connecticut well um, i i very much discovered that school and selected that school because it was in the book and okay. so i really owe my attendance to trinity to the preppy handbook 
and you're, you you work at Yale, which is another one that's in there. <laughs> I, I work at Yale. I went to graduate school there. Um, and uh, yes, uh, there's been a lot of prep heritage at Yale. Of course, we just had the Harvard Yale game this past weekend, which which is mentioned right at the initiation page of the book, right early in the few first few pages of the book. Um, it's it's considered one of the preppiest events in the social calendar. Wow. So tell tell folks about that. I've I've heard I've never been. I've always wanted to go. I, I understand that people go to the tailgate and nobody. <laughs> lets, yeah, lets people I don't think people watch the game, um, even though they they are. It's a football game. So theoretically, people are there to watch the game. But I think it's really a social event. Um, I've had the opportunity to go a few times. I've missed it the last few years because I my job, ironically, for Yale sends me to a conference uh, every year that is in the exact time period of the game so for the past four years that i've worked at this job i keep getting sent away from yale ironically by yale to attend a conference um away i was in toronto and just came back on sunday so yeah it's um it's a really big event um and tailgating is a big part the rivalry is really strong it's not just football it's it's other sports too it's rowing and it's it's pretty much every sport and every, every and not just sports of course it's a it's an intense rivalry between the two schools, but but certainly a lot of the the preppies that are in the the handbook and the prep pantheon, which is the celebration of all the alumni uh, of the past and the people who can, are considered true preps, a lot of them are, are Ivy League graduates for sure. And there is sort of this overlap if you do like a Venn diagram between preppy style and Ivy style. Although I would say that Ivy style, which is a another thing, is is has more of a all male kind of connotation to it. You think of things like, yes, exactly. Take Ivy, the Take right. Ivy book. You think of Brooks Brothers and J Press and menswear. Um, but then when you think of preppy, you could be thinking of a lot of things that are that are not um, just for men. You could think of Lily Pulitzer and Jack Rogers and brands that are very much for women as well. So it's it doesn't have it. Preppy is more co-educational, I guess you would say. Gotcha. Um, yep. and you did mention earlier, and and there's a couple lines in the book. Understatement is essential. Don't show off. Not ostentatious. There's this uh, prep value system. Um, no, not showing, but just sensible. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I think that the preppy ethos is really the old money thing of not being flashy. That if you're if you're if you're confident and effortless in your presentation, it's because you have nothing to prove and and only people who have, I guess, maybe inherited their their wealth and privilege have that luxury. You know, um, I think that people who are striving and, and upwardly mobile worry more about how they present themselves. And so it's not effortless. It comes off as, as very much contrived, I guess. And that's an interesting thing when you talk to people about the prep, you know, as my group does, my my fan club does, when you talk about what does it mean to be preppy, you get into all these debates about authentic preppies would never do that, or only a real prep would do that. And, and what they're really saying is that, in a sense, the more you come off as elegant, but effortless, the more you somehow are an authentic preppy. And the more you seem to have really worked hard at it and, and and the work is is shown the less authentic it comes off the more it doesn't seem like it's 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 sort of more, almost like you're wearing a costume or, or or playing a role but not really the real deal and Got so there's it. a lot of authentic there's a lot of questions of authenticity sometimes the conversations get pretty silly and pretty and uh, dare i say a little bit snobby too at times no, but I again mean, it's all fun, it's all in good fun you know but- that's it. Now, elegant but effortless. It's the appearance of being effortless. Is is that correct? It's the it's the appearance of being. And one and one might argue, and this is, I guess almost gets into a philosophical thing. Is is if you're is is effortless itself perhaps somewhat contrived. It's an appearance of effortless, but is it really truly effortless? Who knows? You know. <laughs> um, so, but I think I think that one thing I would say is that when you do encounter people that are sort of born and bred preppy that that were just raised that way you know that they really do have a certain thing that makes them different from regular people it's kind of like what f scott fitzgerald said to ernest hemingway when he said the rich are different from you and i and hemingway just said yes they have more money um so fitzgerald saw it as as something more intrinsic that was different and hemingway was just very materialistic he said yeah the difference is a bank account well i think that the preppy handbook 
speaks more to the Fitzgerald side of the equation that the that the difference is more than just how much money you have, but it's it's the way you spend your money and the way you live your lifestyle. And it's a very different um, way of life than, let's say, the more numerous competing lifestyles that may be out there. Right. You know, I remember um, hearing something about fashion labels and that the lower end uh, of the same label, the lower end product will have these giant logos. And the more high yeah. tier you get to the point there's no logos. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So there's been a lot of conversations about Ralph Lauren, for example. You know, Ralph, Ralph Lauren, um, without a doubt, is is considered, you know, the greatest lifestyle marketer in, in the United States. Um, nobody has had more more um, has, has has had more successful lifestyle marketing. I remember the New York Times magazine running at one point um, in, in, in the age of print before we became really digital, sometimes five, 10 page ads, full color ads of, of beautiful preppy looking people doing preppy things, you know, yacht clubs and country clubs and, and lounging outside the estate and so forth. Um, but, but Ralph Lauren also over time, or at least the brand, not, not necessarily the person, but the brand Ralph Lauren, Polar Ralph Lauren, got more and more criticized by authentic preppies for the logo because the logo, like you said, grew so big and it's, it's so enormous sometimes that it, again, it's trying too hard. You know, it wants to be seen. It's, it, there's nothing subtle about it. There's nothing understated about it. And I think probably um, the only thing that's still considered maybe a preppy item is with the original logo, which is very small or no logo at all. You know, and then then you're then you're in safer prepper te preppy territory <laughs> because no one no no one would know unless they turn back your collar who the brand is. But it's still go. high quality and it has all the look and the materials that may in fact be a Ralph Lauren item, but but it's that big logo that makes it definitely not preppy. <laughs> so we, we were talking yeah. preppy territory. Uh, I mean, Connecticut's uh, one of the main spots, and we'll we'll touch upon that. We'll, but where I mean, in the United sure. States. Where are folks in in the fan club? Are there are debates about that. Um, so, so yeah, concentrate in New England, but there's a Southern flair there as well. It seems definitely, definitely. So, so I I admit that I'm I'm from Connecticut, and and even my wife has to who who is not from the United States has to remind me that sometimes my own bias towards the Northeast and New England is too much. I forget sometimes that there are Southern preppies and East Coast, well, excuse me, West Coast preppies. But yes, I think that when you look at the preppy handbook, it, it's it's got a healthy balance, I would say, between a lot of references to New England and and Manhattan and, and Boston and sort of the, the big cities of the North, Northeast, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and the surrounding suburbs of those cities. A lot of references to that. But then there's a heavy dosage of Southern um, Southern prep that, you know, you've got people yeah. from Virginia and Maryland mentioned a lot and horse country down there. Um, those two, and sometimes the West coast too, uh, with, San, with San Francisco being sort of the West coast capital of preppy, I would say, cause it's an older city and has a little more heritage, but, um, and my group is kind of similar in that sense. You see people from all, from both coasts predominantly. So I think it's an East coast, West coast, thing for the most part there are maybe a smattering of midwesterners in there from places like ohio and chicago um but it's still if i had to say where do preppy's culture sort of where what's the epicenter of preppy preppydom i would say it's probably new england i think that really when you really um you know had to give it a capital it'd be somewhere like newport or nantucket this is these are the places that that sort of really, really epitomize preppy, I, I think. Even if you're not from those places, it's those resort towns and those colleges and universities and boarding schools that are all, all of which are really in the Northeast. I mean, the, 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 it's really schools and resorts, I think, um, which are so heavily concentrated up here. The only big exception, I think there's a lot of preppy culture in Palm Beach, or at least there was traditionally. Um, that may be changing, but but again, the people who are going there all come from, they're all coming from, you know, north. from the northeast or largely from the northeast, and that's their summer home, you know, or their, their winter home, excuse winter me, winter home, right? And so, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I'm getting my seasons mixed up, and so so yeah, I think that there is some geographic diversity there, but traditional preppydom, I think, is a very northeastern United States 
thing. And I'm just thinking because we're both sitting here in Connecticut. We've got a lot of the boarding schools, Hotchkiss, Choke, Kent, Miss Porter's um, are all, you know, yeah. based. Trinity, as you said, Yale. Yeah, we've got a lot of those schools. Um, so many heavily concentrated here in Connecticut. Um, our neighbor, Massachusetts, has a whole bunch. They've got, you know, of course, Harvard and they've got the Groton School and and um, Andover, which is very, you know, much a preppy boarding school. Um so yeah, I think that I think that we certainly have the schools. I mean, we are the land of schools. There's no doubt. And certainly, if you're thinking about preppy and its original original derivation, it comes from prep, which is to to prepare. And you and you traditionally preppies did that at boarding schools, not exclusively, but that was that was very much highlighted in the preppy handbook and is sort of the idea of where the, the clothing style, the navy blazer, the rep tie, a lot of these things originated from that way of dress, that uniform that was worn at, the, at, at a boarding school once upon I mean, a time. It's almost, you say, for prep, prepare, it's almost synonymous um, with a finishing school in some respects. Exactly, yeah. I think I think that that's really, you know, raising young gentlemen and young ladies and sort of what, what does it mean to be I think those to be raised in such a culture, I think that those schools, at least in the past, probably not so much as not not as much today, but were schools that emphasize character building and culture formation. That was just as important as the actual academic curriculum, whereas today I think that those schools, like all schools, have become hyper competitive, you know, places that people go to because they want to get admitted to the next level. So, you you know, you go to a top boarding school because your parents and you perhaps want to be getting into the best college. And then when you go to the best college, you're thinking about getting into the best graduate school. And it's and when you're getting, thinking about the, you know, MBA program or the law program, whatever program you end up, you're now thinking about getting the best job on Wall Street. or And so everything is very future oriented and goal oriented and i think in the past at least my understanding those schools were more about character building and forming and and proper manners and and proper values and sort of the honor system and th things that are maybe considered a bit antiquated and dated today but were probably very charming and important more so in the past well i mean it's coming back so, to got to be you know maybe it's refreshing in a way that you know here we are in this post-covid world and people sat around in their sweatpants for three years and you know do you, do you think it's a reaction to that that people are like hey we want to be out and about again and we want to have a reason and a look to do it and you know to have that polish that i has i think that i think that the post-covid world we live in um combined with this tech world that we live in you know where everything is changing so much because of technology and AI and, and all the rapid rapid fire change that we're all experiencing has made people, has made some people, not all people, but some people interested in preppy because it's a nostalgic thing. And this is what I said in a, in a recent interview to the Wall Street Journal. I was asked the question, what's, what do you think is attributing to the, the rise of interest in this subculture? And I think that part of it is that you know, when we think about the future, we there's a lot of uncertainty. But when we think about the, it's all uncertainty, really, especially now. But when we think about the past, we have a we have a understanding to some extent of what that was like. We can romanticize the past, which is certainly something that I think those who idealize preppy do. We kind of look at its more glamorous parts. We gloss over maybe some of its less glamorous parts. Certainly, if we're talking about things like equality and inequality we're certainly glossing over some inequalities when we do that uh we're thinking about a very favored group of people that enjoyed privilege for sure but i think that the idea of preppy in an aspirational sense today is that people you know we are in a in a society where there's the potential for upward mobility that's our whole american dream we all want upward mobility none of us really want downward mobility and so we want to have upward mobility, but we also want to have, I think, something um, kind of kind of classic and timeless that, that goes with it. And or some of us do. And those who want to have that classic timeless style and lifestyle that go with it gravitate towards prep because that's what it represents. It represents something that's never going to go out of style. That's always fashionable. That's always respected and and 
and um, admired. So it's sort of like, why wouldn't you want to gravitate towards preppy? It's it's a, it's a safe choice in a sense, and in a like, world that has a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like the yeah. aspect of that. And, and remind me, you're you're an um, an anthropologist by training. Does yeah. That, so that? I'm an anthropologist by training, and so probably that's. That's that's very much related to why I'm in this in a sense, because I, of course, am looking at the world anthropologically and sociologically. I'm thinking about uh, groups and cultures and subcultures. And um, so I'm I'm having fun with running this fan club, but I'm also enjoying the you know sociological and anthropological aspects of it. Um, I'm looking at it kind of as a social scientist all that's the time. Awesome. And in a sense. And in a sense, it's sort of a big project to look at how um, people in our society think about social class and social mobility and and aspiration and think and how they think about the and conceptualize the American dream. It, it's very much what Ralph Lauren was capitalizing when he built this enormous, you know, multi-billion dollar brand that he built. It's the same kind of question that I'm thinking about as I'm trying to build my, my fan club in a sense. So what, what would you say has changed? What what has evolved um, in the last, you know, 43 years, as much as things have stayed the same? Well, you know, how has it, you know, preppy culture, preppy style evolved where, you know, we are in 2023? Well, the, 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 the big and most important thing is is cultural diversity and and the fact that, you know, when you if, when you read the preppy handbook from 1980, it really is very evident pretty fast that it's about people who are white anglo-saxon protestants it's a, it's a book about wasps um although lisa bernbeck herself is jewish um i think most of the co-authors of the book and most of the people she's writing about um and this general spirit of the of the 1980s 1980 preppy handbook is a wasp story and so even when you fast forward to 2010 when lisa and um Others collaborated on a sort of a sequel. She doesn't call it a sequel, but it's her second book, True Prep. The theme of culture. Yep, there you go. The theme of cultural diversity starts to come into play. Uh, it becomes more clear that, as she said in the first book, um, in a true democracy, anyone can become preppy. It's only fair. That's what that's what was written in the in the preppy handbook. If it's truly aspirational, then you would imagine that. 30 years later, when her second book is coming out on the theme, that people have followed that advice. And we have preppies who are not from that background, who are made self-made preppies, not born to this, not silver spoon and born into it, but who aspire to become preppy. And she describes that in the second book. You know, she she describes the Obamas as preppy and and, and a number of other people who are not of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background so ethnicity and religion and race um and and sexual orientation and all the different aspects of social diversity as we think of it today that really weren't evident at all in the first preppy handbook iteration start to re become revealed in by 2010 in the in true prep and here we are you know 13 years later and and i think that People in my group, for example, are very diverse, much more so than anyone who would have bought a preppy handbook probably in 1980, I would think. Um, and so this idea that you can be preppy, that anyone can be preppy, that there are no caste, that we're not a caste system, you know, that this is a, this is a true class system, meaning that it, the mobility is part of it. If you think of it in anthropological terms, a caste system is a is a closed system, only people only you have to be born into it. So if you're in the Brahmin caste, you know, the upper upper caste, you had to be born a Brahmin. You couldn't choose to become a Brahmin. But if you're talking about a class system with mobility, you have the opportunity for anyone to be preppy. And I think that that democratizing of the concept is very appealing. And that's the big thing that I think has changed, that the openness and the diversity. And it fits right in with, you know, the concept of America, as you were saying, you know, with the with the American dream. So it fits in with the American dream. It fits in with meritocracy. You know, the idea that that people um, with hard work and and perseverance can become whatever they want to become. So if if your goal in life is to be preppy and um, and you and you make that your your goal, in theory, 
you know, it's an attainable goal and it's a reachable goal. And so I think that preppy is a more, it's, it's, it's an, it, it occupies an interesting hybrid space because on the one hand, it's still thought of as, as exclusive in a sense. And it's, it's, it certainly implies a certain amount of disposable income that not everybody has and, and, and access to certain lifestyle things that, you know, not, not everybody goes to a polo match and not everybody goes um, to watch the Harvard Yale game. It's still kind of a rarefied way of life. But it doesn't require you. You didn't have to be born a preppy to be a preppy. You can become a preppy by choice. And anyone can be a preppy regardless of their race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and so forth. You know, it's it's open to everybody. So, so it really, in that sense, it's also very American, you know. Right. And very so we, we talked about it as kind of an ethos, but, you know, also it's very much about the fashion as well. Um, what, what, yeah, what, it's primarily... It comes down to that, you know, we, we do talk about in my group, in my fan club, which is on Facebook, um, where there's actually members of the group that have discussions. We do talk about a lot of things besides clothing and fashion. But when you boil it down, the main thing that the, the most commonly discussed topic in what it means to be preppy is clothing. You know, we, we're talking about traditional clothing styles. We're talking about Oxford button down shirts for men and, 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 you know, LL Bean sweater, sweaters and, and, you know, all the sort of staple items that seem to just never go out of style and Sperry top siders, you know, things like that, that, that preppies wore 30, 40 years ago and are, we hope going to continue to wear I'll be wearing 30, for 30 or 40 years. Or now. years. <laughs> so yeah, who knows? Who knows? Is there one yeah, so, article of clothing, one item, and I have a couple of ideas, but that stand out to you as being the signifier? Yeah, um, for me, I mean, I'm going to speak to myself as a as a male preppy person, but um, I would say the navy blazer sticks uh-huh. out. You know, it's a classic. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't go anywhere without one. The buttons um, on I, this one. Do not unbutton, though. Unfortunately, okay. another navy blazer yeah. with the buttons unbutton. So <laughs> that's yeah, but but a good navy blazer may or may not have a, those buttons. Um, I tend to favor the three button style, which is the kind that J Press and Brooks Brothers, original okay. Brooks Brothers, made made famous. Um, I would say that for me, I mean, I, I'm a summer person, so I, when I think about summer, which I'm always thinking about summer, no matter what the temperature is. Um, I would say Nantucket Reds are very a classic item. I wouldn't okay. my closet wouldn't my closet would feel incomplete without a pair of those. So tell people about Nantucket Reds. So Nantucket Reds are a pair of pants that are that originated um, in New England uh, that that are made of a canvas material that has been compared to. I guess original sail cloth um, when cloth, sails were made of cloth, and it, and it's a it, the distinctive feature is the color. They're they're a light salmon color that that the salmon pink basically that fades to an even lighter color with with time, and they look even better the lighter they get usually. And so um, it's it's a good item for you know casual wear or, for, or even formal wear in the summertime. Although much like wearing white after labor day it's it's debatable whether you're allowed to wear them year round it kind of depends on that that's a big question that that nobody has the answer to now, do, but do they're they de- they're to, definitely distinctive do they have to be purchased at murray's in nantucket uh they don't have to there are other places that have made them although i purchased mine at murray's i i would recommend purchasing them at murray's because they are the original and they are the, the best in my opinion but um there are some, there have been some few other makers that have been good. It's kind of like asking the same question about boat shoes. Could you get a pair of boat shoes that aren't Sperry's and would they be the same? Well, I think the Sperry Top Sider is the, is the iconic best, but there are a few other boat shoe makers that are pretty good, you know, but if you, if you want to play it safe, get your reds at Murray's and get your boat shoes at, at Sperry. All right. Murray's toggle shop in um, Nantucket town <laughs> or online. Exactly. <laughs> and get your, and get your Navy blazer at J press or Brooks brothers. And then you're, you're playing you it very go. safe. Yeah. Um, any other, you, we, we, you mentioned the Navy blazer, you, you mentioned Nantucket reds, any other items that stick out to you as, as a guy? 
Yeah, um, I would say um, having having a good collection of of belts um, and ties is important, and it's the certain types of belts and ties that that are you know when you're talking about neckties, you want to have rep ties, you want to have at least a, a tie or two with your school colors, maybe um, you know maybe the the crest of your alma mater. Um, you want to have belts that are maybe embroidered um, that have the same type of thing maybe school colors or, or school crests and of course thing that's with belts and ties you can celebrate some of your hobbies too so if you're a sailor you could have sailboats you could have uh, nautical i'm thinking of sailing because that's my hobby but you yeah. could have um, nautical you know you could have signal flags something that basically again um, you know, with being understated, it, it's messaging and it's symbolism, but it's it's not necessarily understood by everybody. A non-sailor or a non-boater might just look at your belt and say, you know, colorful design, no idea what that means. But but if you're if you're if another boater and you are having a conversation, you immediately recognize each other to be boaters. And now you can strike up a conversation. You have a con basically you have a conversation piece ready to go. Um, so that's part of what I think those clothing. And it's one of the, the belts and ties. I guess I'm I'm selecting that because it's one of the few opportunities that men who are preppy who tend to have to choose pretty conservative clothing. It's one of the opportunities we get a chance to express ourselves uh, and to have some fun. Um, we can also have fun with our colorful pants too. You know, we can we don't always have to wear khaki pants. We can wear, as I mentioned, Nantucket reds and other chinos and all kinds of Lobster prints bright color are popular now <laughs> yes you, you can get you can get printed pants with critters on them uh and you can get all kinds of um pastel colored chinos that you're very fashionable to in yellow and 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 green and and aqua and all kinds of colors that probably wouldn't be worn by a lot of people who are not preppy but but are fun to wear if you are so, so neckties. What what are your thoughts? Are they 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 still uh, sticking around? Are they here to stay? Or um... I enjoyed my conference this past few days in Toronto because of the opportunity to wear neckties. But I'll be honest, I I rarely get to wear them. I wear them to conferences. I wear them maybe twice a year to a yacht club dinner or two, and that's about it. So it's it's there's not a whole lot of use for them, but I think that they are an old school staple that belong in every closet even if you're only going to wear them occasionally you got to have a few and, and and all the more reason to be really selective and have really good ones you know that really kind of represent you in some way that are that are affiliated with your hobbies and your alma mater and all that sort of thing speak to who you are i was thinking of um you know you mentioned the navy blazer and um you know belts and ties is but i'm thinking the ll bean tote what are your thoughts? On yes. That? Yeah. The L.L. Bean Toad and the L.L. Bean Norwegian sweater, too, by ah, the way. Okay. All the, right. the, the Navy sweater with the white um, little ticking marks. I don't know what they're called exactly. Wow. But but the the, the L.L. Bean Norwegian sweater and the L.L. Bean, um, of course, um, the, the tote bags, as you mentioned. And then I guess the third thing would be the boots. I mean, the, the, the it seems like every time, every every fall, we start talking about bean boots again. And, and that's always, it, that topic never ceases to become entertaining for people. People love to talk about them, love to buy them. So L.L. Bean does have some classics that, that are out there. But I think the bean bag that you mentioned, if, especially if it's monogrammed, is, yeah. is one of those timeless, yeah. it's one of those timeless things. It's yeah, everybody should have one for sure. Yeah, I mean, and they're both. I can't speak for the sweater, but I know the the uh, the, the duck boots and the uh, tote bags are still made in Maine, um, and it's been exactly plus years. And I mean, if you talk yeah. about the boots, will wear out like any footwear wears. But the tote bag, if you talk about something that's a classic and you know is timeless and will last forever, I mean, those things are virtually indestructible. They really are. They 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 really do. Tote bags are great. Um, I bought a I bought a sailboat recently from a guy who um, was retiring or had retired and decided it was time to sell his boat. I got a pretty good deal on it. But one of the things I noticed when he was on deck with me is he had a, a tote bag with a very faded American flag. And it wasn't like he bought it to look that way. It just had that vintage look because he'd been boating with that American flag tote bag for 20 or 30 years. And when he gave me the key to the boat, he gave me the tote bag with it i was very excited because it's a very cool. vintage 
pre preppy looking bag and I'm going to bring it on my new boat, which is really an old boat all the time. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned monogramming. T tell us, tell us about that. Yeah. Monogramming is, is again, one of those ways where so preppy is as a style is, is both conservative in a sense that it's traditional and things, you know, you don't get to, be really too wild with your style, but you do get to be personal with your style. You can monogram a belt, you can monogram a shirt, um, you can monogram various items. You can have a monogrammed flask, I have a monogrammed pewter drinking flask and a monogrammed business card holder and a monogrammed belt buckle, um, all sterling silver and all, or pew pewter or silver and all monogrammed. Um, I think that monogramming is just elegant taste tasteful and timeless um it's it, it looks beautiful a, you know watercolor artists can do beautiful jobs monogramming and give you give you personal stationery to send to your friends um so there's a lot i think monogramming itself is actually becoming it's coming back in style it was it was huge when the preppy handbook came out it probably experienced a little bit of, of a decline in the years that followed but it's it's back now um and people are doing it and it's uh -huh. it's 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 elegant and it's personalized i mean you're it i mean the three letter combinations it's hard yeah believe yeah it or not. it's yeah. it's great you know and so i i mean i'm all for it i think i think there's so many opportunities you can monogram so many different things uh and uh why not you know yeah. it is, yeah. is, is it puts your it puts your personal touch on things so i got a i got a few things here we can you know run through them as slow or fast as you want uh um, sure sure Tell me preppy or not preppy. And I, I'm sure in on the, the Facebook page, which I definitely want to hear a little bit more on, and we'll make sure we sure. get folks so they can check it out. All right. We'll yeah. start. Loafers with or without socks? Without socks. <laughs> it it may room. not be it may not be as comfortable. Okay. Um, but it is it is really the appropriate way, way to wear loafers. Um, I would say the exception would be if it's really really cold and you're doing yourself a disservice because it's just you 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 could potentially get sick then you probably shouldn't be wearing loafers anyway at that point uh -huh. but loafers are really in my mind made for warm enough weather that you yeah. don't really need socks and you shouldn't have them yeah. um clean shaven yeah. um it's a good debatable topic, and I'm speaking to someone who has a beard. Um, my brother, yeah. my brother, my brother is my younger brother, who's quite a bit younger than me, has a beard, has had a beard for a number of years, um, and I, beards look great on a lot of guys. I think that traditional, traditionally, um, probably, and if you look at the preppy handbook, um, you see a lot of clean shaven men. You don't see a lot of beards. It was a different era. Uh, it wasn't a bearded era. Now it yeah. wasn't a bearded era. But you know, if for anyone who's watching. The Gilded Age, for example, on HBO, um, which is certainly about early, early preppy culture in the 19th century. Lots of men are wearing beards. In fact, men are more often than not wearing beards. Yeah. So like you said, it's a different I think it I think it's not a that I think that's a matter of personal taste more more so than than the socks question that you asked previously. I think that, you know, some people look good with a beard. You look good with a beard. I think I would look terrible with a beard, which is why I haven't attempted it. Um, um, so I think that that's a really matter of taste. Fair enough. Uh, and and I think the same with sort of hair. Well, for men anyway, longish versus shortish hair. I don't think there's a only one proper hairstyle. Some men look great with with longer hair, and, and others look ridiculous. I would look ridiculous, but some <laughs> look terrific. You know. Uh, and same with women. I think women can get away with all different styles. Um, jewelry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, jewelry. Okay, so. I think that there's definitely classic preppy jewelry. Certainly, for, I'll start with women, of course. I'll, I, pearls come to mind first and foremost. You know, you have to have a strand of of pearls if you if you're a woman. Um, uh, I think with earrings for women, you have to have at least one pair of of just diamond studs. They're classic. You can wear them all the time. You can have all kinds of other options as well, but I think those are two things you, that are a must. Yeah. Um, uh for for men um and women i think it's good to have a wristwatch it's one of those old school things we don't really need it uh we have our phones for that these days but it's just nice to have and you know it's even more preppy if you have a grow grain watch band like mine does i have a, i have a uh, a tank watch with a grow 
a grow grain watch band and which I change periodically. And that's, that's to me, a timeless classic style. I, I rarely consult it to find out what time it is. It's more just sitting well, there, yeah. you know, it's keeping me company. But um, with regard to rings, uh, I tend to think that minimal amount of rings for both men or women is probably more preppy. You know, if you're married, a, a, a wedding ring, of course, um, if you're engaged, an engagement ring, of course, but beyond that, um, I would say no to the pinky ring. That would be a definitely not preppy thing. I would say, you know, class rings. I, 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 some people say that they're preppy. I've never been convinced of that fact. I, I, I understand that you get them at one point, but then I think wearing it forever, I don't know. It's, it, I don't know. It it's seems like something not, you tuck away in a drawer. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's a previous generation sort of thing that people just don't even buy class rings. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, don't see it. Um, so, you know, most people that I know who I would describe as preppy uh, have either, well, they're, they either have no jewelry on their hands or they're wearing a single ring all the time, which is the wedding ring, basically. Yep. And if um, you're going to get the engagement ring, you probably need to get the six prong Tiffany because that's the classic. You know? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody I, think so. I think so. I think that's still the classic. Yeah. Um, black clothing. Black clothing can be extremely elegant and many preppies do wear it, um, but it has its time and place. You know, certainly, of course, um, black tie is a, place, a time where both men and women would be expected and in, in, in appropriately dressed in black. Um, of course, funerals um, are an appropriate place for that. Um, but black as a general rule, as flattering as it is, because it certainly is usually a very flattering look, isn't really a preppy color for clothing, you know? So again, and we don't talk about the black blazer, we talk about the navy blazer. So navy's dark, but it's not black. Um, we, we, you know, the, we do talk about the little black dress. I think that still has a uh, appeal, but that's, but that's not really necessarily just preppy. That's sort of one of those cl classic things that lots of women have in their closet. Um, but no, I think that limited amounts of black clothing are great, but but the the sort of I'm going to wear all black all the time as a matter of practice, then you're really getting away from preppy at that point. Yeah, that's that would be not not really preppy. Um, I don't think. Velour. Velour. Uh, wear it at home when nobody's looking to be comfortable. Uh, we all did that in the pandemic. We wore a lot of velour. I'm sure a lot of comfortable clothing, let's say, and velour might have been part of it because we were living that pajama lifestyle of the pandemic. And maybe we have some velour that was super comfortable. But don't don't wear it in public, though. Definitely not preppy. <laughs> not unless you're trying to be very eccentric, which in itself might be preppy. There you go. Um, now, yeah. here's one where it really didn't exist in 1980, but is everywhere now. Fleece. What are your thoughts on fleece? fleece. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I think that fleece became widely, um, and I'm wearing it right now, actually, as we as you asked me that question, widely um, embraced by preppies very quickly after it, it came out. And, you know, you think about, like, all the people with L.L. Bean and Vineyard Vines and, and all the other brands that make fleece. It seems like everybody eventually made fleece items. Um, I think that fleece... Uh, is preppy yes de definitely um it has to be the right look and style for sure not not every fleece item is preppy just because it's fleece it, it's not fleece that makes it preppy it's not fleece that is automatically preppy but fleece can be very preppy yes um untucked shirts now that's another cultural thing that's changed in the last you know, that is another cultural thing i I'm glad you asked that question because I've actually given this one a lot of thought. Um, my personal preference, um, and this is maybe a matter of taste, is sort of a hybrid. I would never wear an untucked dress shirt. So if I'm if I'm going to put on a you know an Oxford button down shirt, it's going to be tucked in. That's just me. Um, but in the summertime, if I'm wearing a a, a polo shirt. You know, some people have tucked those, and I think that looks awkward. I actually untuck. I I, leave, I don't put it, and I wear them all the time. Polo shirts, you know, short yeah, sleeve yeah. polo shirts. To me, that just uh, 
Well, how about you? Would, would, do you wear either of those? Then do you have a preference in those? I mean, anytime I'm wearing a suit, I always tuck in my shirt. But like, yeah. polo, I don't wear a lot of polo shirts, but I always leave those untucked. And, you know, I yeah. tend to wear a lot of just regular button down shirts, which I don't tuck in generally at all. But yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess um, an untucked shirt, if it's not a, too much of a dress shirt. So I guess a, an yeah, Oxford cloth casual, button down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, or, or a, a viola or a tartan type shirt you know those could be untucked i think mm -hmm. um but a dress shirt i think that's what i'm thinking of more certainly if it's something yeah definitely tuck it in you know um but yeah i think untucked looks really good on on any short sleeve shirt i thought I, I wouldn't tuck in i would i wouldn't tuck in really any short sleeve shirt whether it was a regular crew neck shirt or a polo shirt it just it just doesn't look like it needs to be tucked in to me. But I think in the 80s, they might have done that. I think so. Yeah. I mean, that that I think, I think everything got tucked in in the 80s <laughs> for whatever um, reason. And then how about jeans? Um, I think that everyone should own a pair of jeans. I actually only own one and they're not in great shape. I'm due for another pair. But um, it's good to have a pair of jeans because they're comfortable. They're casual. Ralph Lauren, of course, in his um style sensibility has made jeans a big part of it i mean he he regularly wears them and his models regularly wear jeans uh certainly calvin klein was big on jeans as we know um but i think everybody should have jeans i think that there are people who wear them too often so for example when i show up to the quote unquote business casual thing and someone's wearing a navy blazer with jeans sometimes i just think to myself i think that person's underdressed and it's the jeans that are the reason for that um but it kind of depends you know if 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 it's business casual to me that jeans are underdressed but if if my friends are having a party and and someone's wearing jeans i'm to me that's perfectly fine you know so i think it depends on the setting i think people wear jeans too much in a situation where the situation really calls for something a little dressier and they think that it maybe they can get away with it because they've paired it with other dressy things, but that doesn't always, it works sometimes. It doesn't work as often as people think it does. That's my opinion. Any other hot button clothing items that are, that are hotly debated that I'm, that I'm hotly debated. Um, well, you know, going back to ties, cause I have a thing for ties, um, bow ties versus, um, straight ties. Okay. Uh, I like both. I, I own both. Um, I really, really, with the right outfit, love to wear a bow tie, but but a lot of a lot of people just won't. I mean, ties themselves are archaic as it is. So when you throw in the bow tie, <laughs> it's now you're really old, archaic um, yeah. and old school in a way that some people just aren't comfortable with. And it, and if it's and if it's worn the wrong way, it, it and, or, and tied the wrong way, or clipped on, God forbid, then it really can be kind of clownish. So you, you, if you're gonna do the bow tie, you have to do it gracefully. And but, but I do love bow ties. So hard to pair. Are... You gotta have the right. You gotta be the right person, the right facial features, body. Yeah, type. you have to be able to. It, it's something you have to be able to pull off, and not everybody can. But but if you can pull off a bow tie, I say go for it because it's it's really really old school and and few people who are not preppy actually even think about bow ties i mean <laughs> let, let alone think about ties in general but po to me to me the traditional you know like a tartan bow tie i mean that's that's really preppy and, and not a lot of people are going to be wearing that so kudos to you if you can pull it off um other other things that are um you said contentious or hot button yeah the you hot said, button yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned one of them, which was the sock controversy. <laughs> That's certainly hot button. Um, I would say Lily Pulitzer for women has become a controversial topic. Uh, I think there, a lot of preppy people say, well, the brand, when it was in its earlier days, was of a very high quality and was very, very preppy. And then, you know, like so many brands, it got more mass produced and use maybe material that wasn't a, 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 of such a fine quality. So I know women who will who refuse to buy anything Lily Pulitzer today that's made by Lily Pulitzer, but will pay handsomely for anything vintage Lily Pulitzer. Okay. 
Um, so I think that's a controversy in itself. Um, so that sort of gravitating towards vintage items is a thing. Uh, with regard, going back to men for a second, you know, there's always been this thing of like, what, what is a blade? How is a blazer supposed to be cut? And how many buttons is it supposed to have and all that? That's a big deal in menswear. I, I think that the three button blazer is, is the real deal. And it's often called the Ivy League style where you basically have two visible buttons and one that's sort of folded under the lapel. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's to me, if I'm, if I'm meeting a, another male and they're wearing a blazer, the first thing I look at is that. And if I see that they have the rolled, um, the, the three button roll or the three, two roll as it's called to me, that's, that's a giveaway that they're at least very familiar with preppy culture, if not, truly an actual preppy so it's, it's it's sort of like signaling um in a sense you know it's a it, it says to me preppy you know this is the person who understands and maybe is preppy so i i appreciate little de it's the when they say it's all in the details that's one of the details that i think is really important i i i think that's a definite preppy detail and how about you know in terms of like men's cut i mean today th things seem to be very slim you know in the 90s it was more you know larger sizes um, in, you know, the official preppy handbook, they had the men's cuffs on the pants, which you really don't see as much, at least for. Yeah. For yeah. I think that, um, that the slimmer look, uh, which is more has been and has been more in fashion for some time now, um, can look preppy when it's not pushed to an extreme. You know, I think, I think that frankly, sometimes the slim look, uh, just flat basically looks like you're wearing something that's too tight for you, you know, a lot. And again, it, some of it comes down to who can pull off what, you know, a really slim person can, can pull off slim clothes, but a, a less slim person is looking like they're struggling and maybe they're wearing someone else's clothes that they don't really fit in, you know? Um, so similarly with things like the cuffs that you mentioned, you know, I think that you don't necessarily need cuffs, although I think they're very nice on some pants, but, and, 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 you know, the sockless look looks really good if you're showing a little bit of ankle, but, but sometimes pants, they are just cut too high. I mean, and too, too tight and too high. And it just, when, when it's tight and it, when it's tight and it's high, it's definitely not preppy anymore. Um, not that you want to be baggy and loose, but some, so there's a happy medium somewhere in between, I would say. Fair enough. Um, so how about in terms of where to shop? We mentioned uh, Murray's Toggery Shop in Nantucket. You know, we mentioned Lily Pulitzer, Sperry. W what other brands, what other stores come to mind? Yeah. Also with women, of course, I, I still think that Lily Pulitzer and I think their brand is is responding to that criticism. They're, they're, they've they become I think their quality is coming back, actually. Um, I think a lot of the traditional heritage brands are, are returning to high quality and they're in that camp. So here, Lily Pulitzer for women, for sure. Um, I would say Jack Rogers, the shoes, and um, Palm Beach Sandals, which is the rival company. The, both companies make women's um, shoes that go with that look that are very, very preppy. Uh, I prefer, I would say, of the two Palm Beach Sandals because they're made in the United States, whereas Jack Rogers are not, I don't think. So that's an interesting little they, – they look a lot alike, but there is a distinction in terms of where they're made. They're very similar styles. Um, for for other brands, of course, I've mentioned Brooks Brothers, which is a favorite. They've they've come back in quality and become really really excellent. Uh, J Crew, um, I think, has been excellent for a while and has gotten better even better recently. A lot of my my recent purchases over the last few years come from J Crew. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. So J Crew, not not always not always making preppy clothes so there's lots of stuff at j crew that's not preppy but if you are if you are discerning in your selections you can certainly find the the preppy items the the cable knit sweater especially if it's if it's cashmere for example that's that's a preppy classic the cable knit sweater cable knit cable knit crew neck is a classic um what else uh of course we've talked about ll bean um I would say um, there's a brand that's become very popular in the last few years, and I think it's it's taken a lot of inspiration from Ralph Lauren, which is Kyle James Patrick out of Newport. Okay. Um, it's again 
sort of a, a mixed bag of opinions. So some people love Kyle James Patrick, um, others because it's not as old and as as original as something like Brooks Brothers are are not as keen on it. I like it. Um, I, you start know, somewhere, I right? <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. Um, I'm a fan. I I have bought a number of items from there. I think that the that Kyle James Patrick's lifestyle marketing is very much in the Ralph Lauren tradition where he really has these vignettes of people living this lifestyle. And, and I think the ads are brilliant. And I, and I think that the pieces that I bought, I've been very happy with and they look great. So I would say that for younger people discovering preppy, this is one of the great places to discover it because unlike Brooks brothers, which has been around so long, you know, oldest retailer in America, this is a relatively newcomer on the block, but, but really, makes preppy in a youthful fun way that that i can imagine a lot of people who are you know in high school and college these days who are discovering their own style and say hey i want my style to be preppy that's a place i would say go to kyle james patrick in newport that's where you're going to find the look that you want here's a brand that almost seems like an anachronism from the the 80s lacoste yeah that's it's interesting yes i was thinking about them over the summer um because i as i mentioned i do wear a lot of polo shirts and i mean polo in both senses the polo cut and the polo ralph lauren version of that cut i like the the, the classic polo pl little tiny polo player i think that's what i wore in the 80s and i just never stopped wearing it um but the original original is the lacoste with the with the alligator and those are great i mean if you if you have a vintage one or if you can get a new one they're timeless you know um, i'm Part of me thinks that that should be added to my own wardrobe. I don't have one right now, but I would love to. You know, a white one or a pink one, uh, or maybe a few. I think they're 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 classic. Uh, how about Vineyard Vines? Speaking of newer entrees, yeah. To to me, Vineyard Vines um, is 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 similar to what I was saying a moment ago about Kyle James Patrick. I, you know, relatively speaking, they they've been around longer, a little bit longer than Kyle James Patrick, but they're relatively speaking newer in the in terms of heritage. They didn't exist, of course, when the original Preppy Handbook came out, but they got a lot of attention in the in the sequel True Prep, and it's a great brand. And yeah, the, you can you can find wonderful, very preppy items at Vineyard Vines. Um, and it's funny, I'm thinking as we're talking about this that you know I grew up in Westport, and and a lot of these places that we're mentioning have their own store down there. You, there is a Brooks Brothers, there is a Vineyard Vines, there is a a, a, a J. Crew. They're all really close to each other right on Main Street and Westport. So yeah, that those are all brands that definitely have a preppy vibe. And speaking of Westport, and we were talking about fleece and, you know, this active wear lifestyle just didn't exist in the 1980s, but everybody these days looks like they're about to trek off somewhere you know patagonia for instance yeah patagonia also in westport yeah yeah that's that that is a, a great example and lands and you know but but certainly patagonia especially um really is, is known for their fleece and and kind of i think they really made it a thing and like you said it's a, it, it's this adventure sense of adventure too i think that that part of i guess preppy culture is the idea that you have enough disposable income that you can do a lot of you can enjoy life in a lot of ways and a lot of them involve sporting activities or physical activities or and i think that patagonia speaks to that concept that you can you know do stuff in the outdoors i, I as a sailor for example i would mention a couple brands um heli hansen i mean it's like you can't go to a yacht club without seeing Helly Hansen everywhere. It's 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 a way that sailors dress themselves. It's a way that it's a way that you walk into a, a public place and meet someone for the first time, and you know that they're a sailor. If they if they're wearing a Helly Hansen, uh, they probably are a sailor. Not necessarily, but it would be odd for them not to be. So uh, that's a preppy brand too, for sure. Well, um, Matthew, thank you very much for for joining us today, and uh, it's been great conversation. And, and tell us more thank about. You. Your, your role in the Facebook group and, you know, other social media and how can folks uh, find out more? Yeah. About I'll tell you that. Um, tell you about that. So uh, there is a Facebook group. It's called the official preppy handbook. Um, I actually started it um, years ago, 
just because I thought, well, I really like this book and I, I'm interested in social media. And I wonder if there's a few other people out there who might also share my interest that we could have um, a conversation about. I thought, I thought I'd maybe get 10 or 12 people. Right. And then, and I did, you know, but then I got, then that grew to a hundred and a thousand. And, and now my combined social media presence between the, between Facebook and, and, and Instagram is over 30,000 people. Wow. Okay. And it's growing okay. and it's growing every day. I think my Instagram is getting close to 13,000. Um, and wow. that's the newer page of the two. I've had Facebook a lot longer. Instagram is relatively recent by comparison, but so the difference between the two things, the two platforms, um, is that Facebook has an actual group. So there's a Facebook page that I run, which is kind of like my Instagram page. But then there's a group that people can ask to join or be invited to join. And that's the Preppy Handbook Fan Club group. And in that group, and it's a closed group. So we're, you know, we, we ask questions to, to screen people, make sure they're going to abide by the rules, such as, you know, being polite and courteous and not discussing politics. We don't, we've had, we don't want that to happen in there. Um, but once people can establish that they are going to be polite and, and respectful of others and, and follow the rules, it's a lot of fun. And many people who are in the group say regularly and comment and post that this is their most favorite part of social media social media can be ugly social media can be unpleasant <laughs> sure um, mean-spirited at times but a lot of people say that it's their happiest part of so of, of using social media that's great to hear so oh yeah i'm proud of that i'm proud of that so what started basically you know as this this facebook group for like a handful of people grew into to thousands um and it's still growing that's great to hear well folks yeah it's pretty neat down. And uh, Matthew, thanks so much for, for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here, and, and I hope we can talk again in the future.